Um, uh, I'm Michael Green from Georgetown School of Foreign Service Asian Studies and CSIS, and I will um, be moderating this discussion um, with three of my good friends and uh, three of the leading experts on uh, security in Asia and China and economics. Um, if the panel this morning was on China as a rule maker, uh, our afternoon session is China as a rule breaker. So if you could picture the morning session with little angels over one shoulder. For this session, picture all of us with little devils over the other shoulder. And I know these three guys, believe me, little devils over the other shoulder. Um, we'll start uh, with um, Dr. Derek Scissors, who is at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, where he writes on China, India, um, Asian economics. I read his work, it's excellent. He is um, my favorite uh, myth debunker on the Chinese economy in Washington. Uh, MA in economics, PhD from Stanford. Um, he'll talk about economics. Um, and then uh, 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 Tom Mankin um, at the Naval War College uh, will talk about maritime and security issues. Um, Tom and I were uh, classmates at SICE, PhD classmates. He knows a lot about maritime issues. When we weren't doing our dissertations, which was about 40% of the time, <laughs> we were playing the, the game of imperial diplomacy. And I was Japan and you were Russia. Russia. And uh, although in real history Japan defeated Russia in 1905, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say that Tom crushed me, humiliated me. So he knows his naval and maritime strategy. I know my history, but it didn't help. <laughs> um, and then uh, James Mulvenon, Another uh, old friend and, uh, and very respected expert on cyberspace, on China. His PhD is from uh, UCLA, and he is now the vice president. I'm going to have to find it, my apologies, but it's important for, um, the, for Irish music. Uh, the important thing you need to know about Jim Mulvenon is, like me, he plays Celtic music. I play bagpipes, he plays guitar and sings drunken songs. Um, I can't find it, Jim, I'm sorry. Don't worry about it. It's Irish, isn't it? Yeah. Here we are, Vice President of, really, that's impressive. <laughs> Vice, Vice President of uh, Defense Group, Inc.'s Intelligence Division and Director of their Center for Intelligence and Research. Um, G, uh, Jim is an expert on cyber security. Um, I think everyone who knows the field would agree the preeminent expert in this country on China uh, cyber uh, issues. So <clears throat> we'll, we'll go down the line beginning with Derek. Um, uh, we will want to, um, uh, in the presentations in our discussion and in the q and I think distinguish between norms and rules. They're different. I think in the economic sphere there are clear rules. There are also norms. I think in the maritime sphere there are few rules, some norms, and in the cyber sphere, the rules aren't clear and the norms are heavily debated. Um, we'll want to talk about uh, perhaps lawfare, uh, China's effort to create uh, domestic laws um, to uh, 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 challenge or uh, balance against the international law that doesn't suit their interests. Um, I also think we'll find a distinction when we talk about rules and norms uh, between uh, revisionism and free writing. My sense is historically, uh, rising powers, and you could say this of the United States in some ways as well, but certainly Japan and Germany, and now I would argue China, rising powers tend to free ride on the global scale and be more revisionist in their own neighborhood. Um, and so the regional versus global dimension will be important um, as well, I think. Um, so let's uh, go down the line and then we'll have some discussion and questions from the audience. Am I supposed to go there? Or I think there? we, are you mic'd? Yeah, 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 I think you can, here? if you're Great. comfortable. So All right, well. um, so this is the Bash China panel uh, and I'll try to be a little, a little bit restrained for me anyway. The main point, we have two main points, one which is to remember when we're bashing China is a lot of this is just a function of China being big. Uh, and the, the negative, and I'll just say a little bit more about that, and, and then the negative side of this is I'm going to argue that China is not improving on the econ side, and this is the real problem. Uh, I think it's actually gotten worse uh, with, a, with a caveat that we don't know what this government's going to do. So let's start with the, the big. Uh, when you're talking about China breaking rules, China is big enough in economics that it's understandable if they're at least starting to bend the rules or, or, or make new rules, and they're not going to be very good at it when they first made new rules. We know the U.S. was really bad at making new rules when we started on the econ side. So some of the rule breaking might be misinterpreted as just they're a big economy and, and, and the rules are going to have to change to some extent. Um, they signed on to the existing uh, <coughs> international economic order when they were much smaller. Um, you know, uh, 
they're less, right to now, they're less making rules that, that uh, others can reasonably follow and, and more making rules that benefit China, which was something that was talked about in the earlier sessions, I'm sure we'll talk more about. Um, but I do think there's some leeway that has to be given because we're in a transition period and China's not gonna be good at, at, at rule making, and so it's gonna look like it's rule breaking. Um, now I wanna say something about size that I think we tend to forget. Let's compare China to India. It is not at all obvious that China is a better <laughs> economic rule breaker than India. I think I would actually pick India as the bigger economic rule breaker. What is obvious is China is much bigger and more important. So whatever deviations that from, from the rules uh, they engage in, we're gonna notice a lot more, they're gonna matter a lot more than Indian deviations. And I picked another big country. I mean, we talk about what little tiny countries do. When they break the rules, nobody pays any attention. So a lot of, of the ammunition, uh, the, sorry, the attacks I'm gonna put at China, the ammunition just comes from size. And the US should be sympathetic to, to this because the same thing is true with us. You know, people will point out, oh, I can't believe, and, and I, I did this myself in a Weekly Standard blog last night, I can't believe what the US is doing with Japan on, on autos, it's ridiculous. Um, but it's also n much more noticeable because the US is doing it. Some little country does it, nobody cares. It's not part of the TPP, it's not a crippling blow to the world trading system or anything like that. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm gonna try to focus on Chinese rule breaking that passes understandable because they're in transition or it's exaggerated just because they're large and go to destructive. Um, trying to keep in mind Mike's uh, opening remarks about norms, which he didn't tell me about till 30 seconds ago, so I'm winging this, it's all his fault. If it doesn't make any sense. Um, we'll do the balance of payment side. The balance of payment side, um, and I'll get to some issues you're familiar, these are more norms. So we have currency manipulation. There's no rule on currency manipulation. Um, we have an incredibly difficult time defining it. Um, and and uh, you know, from the straight economic standpoint, the, the Chinese peg to the dollar, which is still in existence despite being scrapped four times, has never been scrapped. Um, is much less manipulative than the U.S. flooding the world with dollars due to our monetary policy. So there's, there's not really a rule there, there's a norm, and, and, and we're violating that norm more than the Chinese are. That doesn't mean there isn't a problem, there is a problem, and I, I put it to, to my Chinese uh, associates all the time, like you're, you're now arguably, depending on what measure you use, the second biggest economy in the world. When are you gonna get your own currency? And this is ridiculous. Stop acting like you're a satellite of the United States economically. Um, that's what a peg currency does. I mean, Hong Kong has a peg currency. It has seven million people. Of course it has a peg currency. So that's not a rule, uh, but it is a norm that China is violating, and it's one that exaggerates global cycles because the yuan and the dollar move together instead of separately. So we get booms that are too big, 2005, 2006. We get contractions that are, that are, that are too sharp, 2008, 2009. I'm not saying China is primarily responsible. I'm saying the peg to the dollar contributes to that. What also contributes to that is another norm violation, which China's accumulation of large balance of payment surpluses and, and, and foreign currency reserves. It's not a rule. There's no rule about this, but it is a norm, and, and, and they're contributing to global imbalances that way. Um, the closed capital account. Uh, small countries or countries that are, in, are suffering financial instability are supposed to restrict the movement of capital. Not big countries that are not suffering from financial instability, which China hasn't been suffering from until recently. So is that a rule? Um, some of us would like it to be a rule, but it isn't a rule. It's more a norm, and China's again stretching the norm. So on the balance of payment side, we talk about currency manipulation in this country. There are a lot of more important issues. It's, it's China's, China's breaking norms more than rules. Uh, let's talk about the WTO, um, and this is where there's a dispute about whether China's breaking rules or breaking norms. They're certainly breaking norms. I would argue also they're also breaking rules. China's WTO accession negotiations were, were fake in important respects. And I want to, you know, I want to talk fast, which I am doing, and I don't want to take up time because I want to have more question and answer and discussion. I'll give you one example. Uh, because I was sort of involved in this on the periphery, there was this big argument over whether we had 49% telecom joint ventures or 50% or 51% and where they could be 49, where could be 51, but they all required a Chinese partner. And guess what happened after China joined the WTO? Sorry, you can't have a Chinese partner. That was just disingenuous. I mean, you, know, you could say there's not a rule about that, but you were making, you were agreeing apparently in good faith to allow telecom joint ventures and you didn't. I mean, that's, that's pretty close to breaking, uh, not an important rule, but, but, a, but a rule nonetheless. Um, 
the disputes that we have now, for example, over, over rare earth elements, technically China's following WTO procedures, so you can say, well, they're not really breaking the rules, but they have a repeated pattern, not just rare earth, autos, other minerals, um, it goes on solar, it goes on and on and on, where they extend the process as long as possible, then they don't implement the required corrections in a timely fashion, so they get years of, of altering industry conditions, and it's sanctioned by the WTO. Um, is it breaking WTO rules? No. Is it breaking the rules of an open trading system? Yes. And those are maybe not codified in the WTO, but there have been rules that, that most of the large traders, in fact, all the large trading countries have followed to now. Um, Doha round, IT, the ITA negotiations, the services. In all cases, you can't say there's a rule governing Chinese action where they're required to do something that they're not doing, but the rule of trade, you know, the, the, the rule that we're all trying to negotiate trade progression, the Chinese aren't trying to negotiate trade progression. They, they got what they wanted, which is membership in the WTO, and since then the WTO has been used to protect their, their uh, individual and mercantilistic economic interests. So the WTO side goes back and forth between breaking norms and breaking rules, but we're certainly getting some sort of violation from China. Now we're going to get into straight rule violations. Violation and, and, and the number one easy one to start with is, is intellectual property rights. And here, this is a, a clear example of China not getting better. The, 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 what we used to say about intellectual property until maybe 10 years ago or, or even, even more recently is, as countries get richer and they start developing their own intellectual property, um, they, they protect intellectual property better. That is not what's happening. What China has done is they're using the technology they stole to steal more technology. I, I mean, that's literally true in, in several important cases. I'm not going to emphasize cyber because Mulvenon's here and he can do it. Um, but th that's an example of, of rule breaking in intellectual property and a deterioration on that front. Um, I wrote in 2003, this is in prints for clients, saying that the Chinese had just started a, you know, have, have intensified a strategy of acquiring foreign technology, then pushing multinationals out. This later was, was called, you know, became famous as indigenous innovation. Um, <laughs> Respect for IPR at home is, is getting better, but respect for foreign IPR, if anything, is declining. We have attacks on Qualcomm, Interdigital, other US technology firms, basically which are coercive IPR attacks, and those are against TRIPS rules. And China gets away with them because they gain the WTO, which is why I gave you the WTO section beforehand, and because they intimidate foreign companies into not complaining. So on IPR, China is absolutely a rule breaker, and I, you know, it's arguable because there's multi, multiple dimensions to this. I, I would argue that they're getting worse at rule breaking. And then the last thing is, is uh, state-owned enterprises, and I don't think you can call the whole effort, the fact of Chinese state capitalism and the, and the subsidies of state-owned enterprises rule breaking because we don't have any rules on it yet, although the TPP is trying to establish one. And because Japan, Korea, some other countries did this to some extent with their national champions, but it's been taken to a much higher level in China, and some of the extensions that China has made are in fact rule breaking. So, for example, regulatory protection, there are a set of, I call them the state teen, which is the state 18 sectors, where you're not allowed to beat state firms. And, you know, if there's a rule in international economics, it's just you're supposed to have some sort of sense of open competition. And that rule is being broken to protect state-owned enterprises and, and, and more obvious and sweeping fashion than it ever was in Japan and Korea, which is not to say that they also didn't do things that, that, were, that were troublesome. Uh, financial subsidies, we have, this is not a rule because the WTO is flawed. Um, Chinese financial subsidies don't tend to promote exports. What they do is block imports which means they interfere with other people's exports, which is kind of the flip side of, of something we do have a rule on. So uh, there isn't really a rule there. There should be, um, and it certainly breaks the, the norms. Uh, another set of, of rules, and this is a violation of, absolute violation of national treatment, and it has not been called on because it, I think because people are cowardly, uh, to, to, be, to be blunt. Um, Chinese antitrust rules don't apply to standard enterprises. I mean, they apply to standard enterprises whenever they feel like it. But they apply directly to foreign firms, and they're being used increasingly on foreign firms, including tiny little foreign firms who are said to have a monopoly in a tiny little market, and are using that monopoly to coerce a much larger state-owned enterprise, which has a geographic monopoly in that market, which is not subject to the antitrust law. I'll say that again, because I said it too quickly. Foreign firms, which are literally 1% the size of the Chinese firm, Firms. Their market is defined in this, such a narrow terms that a foreign firm appears to have a monopoly in China. They are subject to the antitrust law. 
for, for pricing, uh, unfairly gouging a giant Chinese firm, which has a huge geographic monopoly in China, which is not subject to the antitrust law. So we're, we're violating uh, what is a rule in, in the WTO on national treatment. It's happening repeatedly, um, and it's not, it's not being challenged. And uh, so I'll just bring, bring this back. There are lots of things we can point at. As Mike has pointed out, some of them are violations of norms, which can be important, maybe less dramatic. But some of them are violations of rules. Um, some of the rule violations are because China's large, but sometimes China gets away with rule violations because it's large. Uh, and I think that problem is actually getting worse. So that's my bashing China, part participation in the bashing China panel. Thank you. <laughs> okay, onto the, uh, onto the security realm. Uh, and I'd say, uh, you know, in the security realm, there are very broadly, you know, two, two views of, of Chinese behavior. Um, one is that the Chinese leadership is uneducated and poorly socialized. And, and the theory there is through engagement, dialogue, uh, will bring the Chinese leadership to understand the correct way of, of doing things. Uh, the other view is that China has its own objectives and its own strategy. And it is, in other words, a, an independent actor that may see things differently, perhaps very differently, than we do. Uh, now, I, I, I state those, you know, those two positions uh, first to associate my, myself with the latter, uh, but also to, to point out that I think that that former view is, is pretty is per pervasive, um, either explicitly or more frequently implicitly in, in interactions with, with China and the security sphere. But I, I, you know, I view the, the second, second uh, as much more persuasive. And in trying to think through you know, how China constructs the, uh, its, its rules uh, in its role, I want to just offer three, three different lenses and tease out the implications uh, in the maritime domain. And these three lenses for understanding Chinese behavior has to do uh, first with a, a hierarchical view of, of international relations, second with a continental geostrategic outlook, and third, a, a historical narrative of, uh, of victimization. So let, let's talk about the first, the hierarchical view of international relations. And here I'd, I'd want to contrast uh, that view with you know, the, the, the dominant view in the West. And the dominant view in the West is that states are de jure equal, even if they are de facto unequal. UN General Assembly being the, the epitome of that. Uh, Burkina Faso has the same vote as the United States. Um, I'll say that the Chinese view uh, has, you know, has a, a, a heavy overtone of a, of a hierarchical view. So China traditionally maintained, you know, hierarchical relations uh, between it and states, vassals, tributaries on its on its periphery. Uh, and I, you know, I think the uh, this view is manifest not only in you know historic Chinese statecraft, but also in more recent statements uh, from. Chinese foreign minister, among others, but I think it also colors the way China deals with um, with with disputes, including maritime disputes. Right? We tend to favor multilateral uh, dispute resolution. Uh, China f favors bilateral. I think bilateral because it allows China to to try to get the maximum uh, leverage over uh, the small countries uh, with whom it has it has disputes. Um, I think you know uh, an interesting test case for that will be to, to take a look at the, uh, the the agreement just signed this week in Qingdao as part of the Western Pacific Naval Symposium, uh, where you know there's there's a, you know the, the rudiments of a, of a code of conduct for incidents at sea. Um, too soon to tell, of course. I, I say it's a good it's a good test case, but even so, even now, I think there's some of the statements coming from the Chinese side seem to indicate that it'll be more applicable to some than to others. Uh, and that the China may not feel bound by the code of conduct that it that it signed. Um, that's number one. Number two is uh, China acts according to a, what I would call a continentalist uh, geostrategic out, uh, outlook. And again, I'd, I'd draw the contrast to the outlook that I think most Americans just take as as given. Um, the United States is a maritime power, and for the United States, like Great Britain before it, sea power is a necessity. I think we view uh, interaction uh, in, the, in the maritime domain as positive sum, as win-win. 
We view the ocean, uh, in the words of uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan, you know, as a great highway, as, as a commons, as a, as a avenue of international commerce. And uh, it's, it's uh, a, uh, a sense that the use of the sea brings benefit to all, brings trade, brings commerce, brings, brings prosperity. China, by contrast, has historically been a continental power, and continental powers view the seas differently. Uh, whereas you know, we are insulated, to some degree, from threats by, by the sea, uh, continental powers like China uh, must coexist with neighbors that pose the threat of invasion. And I think China sees, Chinese leaders see the sea as uh, an avenue from which threats may emerge. And thinks about uh, the sea really from the land, from the land outwards. You see this in uh, a number of different uh, patterns of behavior. First, a neuralgic response to activities, maritime activities on China's periphery, right? And, and attempts by China over time to change the, uh, the accepted patterns of maritime activity uh, and, and air activity on China's, China's periphery. Um, you also see it in the development of so-called anti-access or counter-intervention capabilities to, uh, to hold other powers away from China's borders. Uh, and you also see it in a, in a territorial view of, of, of maritime disputes really anchored on, on, on territory. Um, so, and I think that's actually a very, it's a pervasive view, and oftentimes we speak in Mahanian terms about the, the commons uh, when the Chinese view things very, very differently. Uh, the third uh, is what I call a, a historical narrative of, of victimization. This is the, 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 the narrative of the century of humiliation, and I use the quotes, and I use the term narrative, uh, because it, that narrative coexists, but sometimes uncomfortably, uh, with some of the historical facts. But nonetheless, I think it is a governing narrative in China today. Uh, it's, it leads to the belief that whatever the international norms and the international rules, they were created by someone else, uh, and that, that uh, they may not always apply. Uh, it also, that view leads to historical claims of various, uh, various salience and, I'd say, expanding historical uh, claims. I think it also has fed into a, an anti-Japan narrative uh, that, that is uh, expressing itself, I think, in some dangerous ways in the, in the maritime domain. So I guess you know, my bottom line is uh, China follows rules, but, but they, are, you know, they are different rules. They are, they're rules based on uh, some, some different uh, views of international relations, different views of strategic geography, and also a different uh, historical narrative. And I think where we fail to understand those, uh, we risk we risk real problems. Thank you. I, you want to wave your little red book before you? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Over to you, Comrade. Yeah. Uh, well, you can't be a China specialist without a little red book, right? So, um, the uh, well, let me begin. I want to thank um, Oriana and, and Stephanie for for inviting me to come here today. Um, it was surprisingly difficult to get my remarks for today approved, uh, but we'll we'll soldier on. Um, in the, as an homage to Kurt Campbell, I have three quick Please points. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first is that China has a long history in the modern era of being a rule breaker. Um, you know, obviously a party born of revolution, uh, which was clearly not a dinner party when it came to lopping off heads. Um, and that from the beginning, the new PRC, when it was inaugurated in 1949, explicitly rejected the international order uh, by definition. Um, it was something that was gonna be overthrown in a global revolution, and all of the existing order and all the existing order's rules were simply impediments and hegemony and imperialism that needed to be overthrown. Why do I bring all this up? Well, because the same party is in power that used to believe that. And if you read Xi Jinping uh, and you see the neo-Maoist uh, push and the Mao pins on <laughs> government officials' lapels and everything else, it's tough not to sort of draw a direct line uh, through all of that. 
Um, and they clearly didn't write the rules. Um, and even, even if going so far as the UN Security Council uh, arrangement with, with the Republic of China and how that had to be redone. Uh, but you see this all through the non-aligned movement in the 50s. Uh, you see this through the peaceful principle, the five, uh, pin, uh, five principles of peaceful coexistence uh, and the Bandung Conference and all of that good stuff. Uh, and they fomented revolution abroad. They tried to break other people's rules. I mean, 500,000 people died in, in 1965 and 1966 in Indonesia uh, when the PKI, which had been supported by um, Mao's regime, uh, was slaughtered by uh, Suharto and his and, and his his leadership. Um, and the PRC system, and this is a, a preview of, of something I want to say at the end, also during this time even broke its own rules. I mean, the, the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution is a perfect example of a party turning on itself, violating its own internal norms, and trying to destroy itself. Um, and I couldn't help but think this, this uh, morning as we were listening to the lunch speech uh, that one of the gravest violations of rules during this period uh, was, in fact, the attacks on the British Embassy. Uh, during the Cultural Revolution, which violated China's commitments under the Vienna Convention and a number of other international laws. Um, and so that I want that to be a preview of, of, of my point number three, which talks about how China, in a different way, is now continuing to say one thing and do another to violate it, its own rules. Um, but whereas the PRC, as a, as a, as a, as a matter of state ideology, uh, used to celebrate rule breaking, um, it now desperately wants to be seen as a status quo member of the international order, um, while still selectively following the rules and breaking the rules and breaking the norms. Now, I will say as a caveat, you know, as a citizen of a great power, that one of the perks of being a great power is selectively adhering to <laughs> rules and breaking norms. So I'm not trying to be all judgy about this, um, but the uh, but it, but the as China has been a rising power, they have crossed a transition point uh, where they are increasingly are less shy uh, about asserting their imperatives uh, as a great power. Uh, now I was asked to come here and talk about uh, cyberspace and and the cybersecurity issue, and if you look. At this at the strategic level, what's very interesting about it, because Tom mentioned the commons, and I'm glad Kristen Lord isn't here, because even though my name is on a CNAS report about the global commons, and I contributed to a chapter on cyberspace as a global commons, I'm here to tell you that cyberspace is not a global commons. Um, in fact, uh, the Chinese and some of the countries that are on, signed on to China's International Code of Conduct in Cyber, I think actually have a much more uh, accurate and realistic understanding of what sovereignty means in cyberspace uh, than Hillary Clinton's State Department did and a number of other people. In this case, in cyber China, like in some uh, some other issues, China is more Westphalian than everybody else. They're sort of, you know, they're, they're trying to go as far to the right on Westphalianism as they possibly can in terms of adherence to sovereignty. Um, they, uh, in particular, they understand implicitly that the architecture of what we call cyberspace, and I'm not talking about the virtual avatar lives you all lead where you sit in chat rooms talking to other people who will also like on the weekends to paint themselves blue and run around in the woods with bow and arrow doing avatar cosplay. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, you're, that's, that's your own business. Um, but the, the bottom line is every switch, every router, every computer that makes up the architecture of the internet is, in the, is within the sovereign boundaries of a nation state and therefore governed by its laws, or that traffic travels on submarine cables or satellite connections that are owned by companies that are incorporated in countries and therefore governed by their laws. This is not the sea, this is not the air, this is not the space. There is no sovereignty less part of cyberspace. And the Chinese understand this, and this is one of the main reasons structurally they're pushing to move international internet governance to the International Telecommunications Union under the, I, under the UN, because they understand this is not an issue that needs to be dealt with uh, as a commons. Now, the cyber espionage, I can very easily talk about this issue because there are no rules and there are no norms with regard to either espionage or cyber espionage. So it's not exactly fair to say that China is breaking rules or norms. Uh, we're just terribly upset about how good they are at stealing our crap. Um, and, but that's not the same thing as criticizing someone for breaking a rule. Um, but I will didactically make the following distinction, which I believe has been blurred uh, in the last six to nine months um, as we've discussed uh, he who must not be named. Uh, and that is the distinction between traditional espionage 
espionage um, and commercial espionage. And the United States before all of this recent kerfuffle, or as we say in the South, the recent unpleasantness, um, before all of this happened, we were very aggressively pounding on the Chinese side about this distinction between using cyber for traditional espionage against government and military targets, which is perfectly acceptable, although regrettable, because everybody does it, um, and using it against commercial targets, which the United States government does not do. And I realized that you know, recent information would suggest, uh, with disclosures involving Huawei or Petrobras, would seem to suggest that that's not true. I'm here to tell you it is absolutely not true. And, it is, it is, and the United States is probably the only government in the world that does not do it. But they don't do it not out of any sort of moral uh, imprimatur, but be for the very practical reason uh, that they wouldn't know how to share even if they did. Okay? Most of the countries we're dealing with have a single state-owned oil company, a single state-owned chemical company, a single state-owned telecoms company. If their intelligence service steals something, it's very easy to figure out who to give it to. Okay? But let's just say notionally uh, that somebody in the US government stole the newest networking technology from an unnamed Chinese company. Who would you give it to? Would you give it to Cisco? Would you give it to Juniper? What about the dozen or so networking startups in Silicon Valley? Here's the ironic thing about the US system. Any one of those companies finds out that they didn't get the technology, they actually have legal standing to go to the Department of Justice for an antitrust case. Is that crazy or what? <laughs> so in the absence of an ability to share, and we all know, right, sharing is caring, um, in the ability of an absence of ability to share, we don't do it at all. But it is a little, I understand why the other countries find it incredible to believe that. But you know, when, when there are allegations about stealing information from Huawei or Petrobras, you must remember that it is to support strategic economic intelligence to senior policymakers, not ExxonMobil and Cisco. And that is a fundamental distinction, and I will continue to argue about that uh, until I am in the soil. Um, now, if you drill down on this issue, um, we're also very concerned about a whole set of behaviors that are related to this cyber espionage that fall, frankly, below legal thresholds. And this involves a very large volume of extra legal technology transfers uh, that my, I and my co-authors documented in our book last year on Chinese industrial espionage. The Chinese system has hundreds of organizations that we identified, thousands of personnel that form a gigantic cadre devoted to large scale, you know, planetary scale, open source exploitation of foreign uh, science and technology and research material, as well as one-way transfers of technology out of individuals through a huge network of pioneering parks and tech transfer parks and a, a, a gigantic infrastructure <coughs> that is designed it to prime the pump for the indigenous innovation uh, that Derek mentioned earlier. Now, none of that behavior, in, or the vast majority of that behavior, technically falls below any of our EAR thresholds or any of our legal thresholds thresholds and therefore can't be described as illegal behavior. It could be reclassified as a TRIPS violation. It can be reclassified as a lot of things. Um, but it is deeply troubling. It is deeply injurious to American economic competitiveness. And it is behavior that is seen as unacceptable. And we are reforming the export control system, I think, on one level, precisely because it's not that the Chinese were breaking rules, but that they were exploiting gaps in our system that allowed them to steal US companies blind and universal. Universities. Um, one way that I do believe, and that getting to the norms issue, um, uh, is the IT global IT standards regime is a perfect case. Uh, the Chinese regime explicitly and in black and white letters uses the international standards regime as a trade weapon. Um, they did not want to pay the royalties to Erwin Jacobs at Qualcomm and other people for CDMA, um, and so had a state-funded effort uh, to put together all of the tech, you know, parallel technologies for all of the major international telecom standards. There's a Chinese HDTV standard. There's a Chinese Wi-Fi standard. There's a Chinese, you know, you name it, see, uh, a fourth-generation telecom standard. Almost all of these standards, through legitimate international bodies like the International Standards Organization under the UN, the IEEE, the Internet Engineering Task Force, have almost all of those standards have been rejected as technically inferior. But they nonetheless are appearing in products like the dual WAPI Wi-Fi chip that's in my iPhone 5 because all of the equipment 
is being assembled in China, and China is using the full weight of its regulatory apparatus and its product certification apparatus to force Western companies that are building products in China to incorporate those inferior rejected technology standards in their products. That's the only reason there's a, a dual WAPI Wi-Fi chip in my phone is because Apple wanted a single unified global production chain uh, for its phone. It didn't want to build a China phone and then a rest of world phone. And it couldn't because China wouldn't let them build it at Foxconn. Um, but the real dilemma there is when you talk to the Apple developer connection about the WAPI side of that chip, they tell you they don't know anything about it. They say it's black boxed. They say three out of four of the crypto algorithms involved are state secrets and weren't shared with them by the State Encryption Management Bureau in China. That is not, in my view, a legitimate trade behavior. That is the manipulation of the international standards regime as a trade weapon. Um, and we're going to continue to see that, particularly given the recent revelations and the push to further divest all Chinese networks of non-domestic telecoms equipment and computer equipment. Um, the third point, though, I'd like to make, though, is that China, and this is the part that troubles me the most, um, breaks its own rules or its own stated principles. Um, in particular, um, I've noticed a phenomena that over the last 30 years, of course, we've all read the magazines, right? There's been this huge rise in Chinese political and economic and military and social and diplomatic power. But the thing that's bothered me the most, and I think that we've seen periodically, is that there has been a dangerous and disturbing lag in two key areas, strategic communications and crisis management. And we've seen this again and again and again in our crises with China. Um, the, one of the difficulties we have in, in this, on the strategic communication side is that the Chinese regime, even as it evolved from a rising power to a great power, has been trapped like a, like a, like a bug in amber inside its own rhetorical system dating from the, from the uh, pre-modernization um, uh, pre era. In other words, things like the five principles of peaceful coexistence, you know, non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries. What? Give me a break. Again, one of the perks of being a great power is interfering in the internal affairs of other countries. Um, and when China started its go out strategy 10 years ago, all it's been doing is interfering in the internal affairs of other countries, buying $3 billion of a country's copper, building them a new soccer stadium, building them a new presidential palace, building them a new foreign ministry, siphoning off large amounts of money for their kleptocratic children so they can race Ferraris in Monaco. Um, you know, all of that is a piece of a part of an international go out strategy um, that, you know, fundamentally involves the effect, you know, and we see this in Africa and other places, destruction of the domestic textile industry through Chinese imports and the labor problems they've had because they've insisted on using Chinese workers in these facilities rather than the locals and, and things along those lines. Stationing troops abroad. <clears throat> well, it's a little difficult to maintain a constant rotation in the anti-piracy task force off the Horn of Africa and then also claim, you know, morally, righteously that you're not stationing troops abroad. And it's really difficult to provide logistics and sustainment to those forces if you continue to insist that you don't have foreign bases. And so you have to do all of these ideological gymnastic backflips about places, not bases, and we're going to prepo equipment at Costco bonded terminals, but that's not really a base, even though it's military. And we're going to use our leverage to make sure that the host country allows us to have a port visit so that we can replenish food stocks. So on the one hand, you have this set of clearly outdated principles that don't really conform to what China is doing in reality, but they are trapped by them for international reputation reasons. A good example was China's, you know, for years China was advocating in the CD in Geneva um, in favor of the Paros Treaty on Space Weaponization. It's a little difficult to square that with their January 2007 anti-satellite test. But of course, after a week of, of, of uh, ideological incoherence about that, they came out and said, and I quote, we tested an anti-satellite weapon in order to convince the United States to negotiate the banning of anti-satellite weapons. I would have loved to have been in the meeting when those talking points were approved. Because talk about a culture that is capable of, of, of holding two contradictory thoughts in their mind at the same time. It is, that is the essence of Maldun in my mind. Similarly, no first use of nuclear weapons. 
ironclad, will never be revised, will never be changed, even as we watch on the ground deployment after deployment of DF-31 Alpha Road Mobile ICBM brigades, a new generation of at sea SSBNs, um, and a whole force that to me from the outside looks like an accidental breakout into a limited war fighting force. Well, how the hell do you square that with Yao Yunju's comments about you know, how they're gonna have no first use forever? Um, for some people in Washington uh, that, that, that Derek spends a lot of time with, this plays into um, a strategic deception narrative, which says that the way you explain the difference between what China says and what China does is that it's a gigantic strategic deception, and that there's somebody you know, with a white Persian cat in their lap in their floating <laughs> volcano island headquarters uh, that is sort of directing all of this, right? Um, my argument is somewhat different, which is that the, it's the divergence between <laughs> China's stated principles and its actual action that is the cause of serious Bob Jervian sort of misperception uh, will cause crisis instability and will cause escalation control problems with the additional absence of confidence building measures and, and other things. And so it, you know, it is in our interest for China to, to frankly to embrace Confucius because you know, Confucius' concept of the rectification of names, the Zhengming. Because Confucius said there will not be harmony in the empire until the name of the thing matches the nature of the thing. That to me is the essence of China's problem right now. You have a Chinese Communist Party managing a state capitalist economy. Uh, you have a nuclear force that doesn't look like a no first use force and on and on and on. Uh, and so well, my one piece of advice to Beijing would be Zhengming, Zhengming, Zhengming. Otherwise, the, there will be continued misperceptions of China's intentions and China's capabilities uh, going into the future. Excellent, thank you. Um, Oriana, remind me, how much time do we have? 2.30. Okay, um, let me ask one uh, sort of speed round, and maybe two, and then I'll take some questions. <clears throat> um, you are all, none of you are liberal idealists or liberal institutionalists, so I'll dispense with the idea that somehow we're gonna come up with norms that through you know, socializing and bureaucracies for peace create yada, yada, yada. Okay, that was the morning wimpy panel. <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna. The United States Institute for Peace. That's right, <laughs> apologies to our hosts. It's great. So let me get right to the. Which has tremendous perimeter security for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> <laughs> let, me get right, uh, let me get right to the, uh, to the interest-based approach to this, national interest-based approach to this. So um, are we able to shape Chinese behavior in each of these areas you've discussed? And if we are, um, each of you give me a number from one to 100, zero to 100 percent, what percentage of our ability to shape Chinese behavior in these economic norms and rules will be based on deterrence? And what percentage will be based on self-interest? For example, China may want to join TPP because it wants to use it for internal reform. <clears throat> or in the maritime sphere, China may want some code of conduct because it has sea lane interests out to the Gulf or in, in cyber or outer space. So, so uh, let me start with Derek, we'll go down the line and you know, give me a number. You know, it, 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 what percentage of our ability to change China's behavior in these areas is gonna be, we're throwing out the window, socialization and norms and bureaucracies for peace. Right. What percentage will be fear uh, and what percentage will be greed? <laughs> How much of it will be requires to be deterring and how much of it will be China's own self-interest. Okay, I mean, I would actually make the question- <laughs> Or are we really just- Even uglier and, and say you forgot compellence. Um, yeah. You know, okay, I would enough. say there's a, there's a five to 10% area in economics where China imports a lot of commodities, including soybeans, at the sufferance of the United States. So if you really, really wanted to get ugly, uh, there's, there's, there's very high costs that could be inflicted upon China in that situation. It would also cost the rest of the world a lot, and that gets, that gets to the real question here. I would put the number as quite high that we could, you know, that our, our ability to influence China uh, potentially is quite high, like 75, 80%, but all of those entail some sort of sacrifice, including the one where it's in self interest. The way you get China to see it's in its self-interest to reform state-owned enterprises is have a TPP chapter on state-owned enterprises that they can meet in a reasonable time, which means we have to give up something. If you set the bar so high that the Japanese have trouble meeting it, include IP, the same thing, this issue was brought up in Tokyo over the weekend, then the Chinese are going to look at this and say, okay, you know, I'd, I'd kind of like to join, but I mean, come on, you guys are not being reasonable here. So, so we can appeal to that we, we have a lot of influence over China, uh, both on the self-interest side and, and the deterrence side and the 
balance side, all of them are going to require sacrifices by the United States, including the self-interest part, and the sacrifices are going to are going to get uh, uglier. In terms of what I would you know be short of compellence, but beyond self-interest is what we're trying to do, and I think unfortunately failing in TPP, which is create an environment where we're hurting the Chinese in a certain direction by setting up these agreements that say, look, you can join, you can join. If you don't join, things are going to get worse for you. Um, that's not easy. We're having trouble with it right now. We're going to have to make um, economic sacrifices or concessions to our TPP partners, to our TTIP partners, and so on. So I think our influence over China is potentially very high. It all comes, it all comes including the self-interest part, with a cost. And I, I think the question is not whether we can influence China. It's whether we're willing to pay the price to influence China. And that's a, you know perfectly legitimate national interest question. Good. So TPP is key. How'd they go, by the way, in Tokyo? Uh, <laughs> no. it, yeah. <laughs> Don't uh, start. More work to do. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, if, I, if I was, you know, I think the U.S. in the maritime domain has, has uh, the United States and, and its allies, I mean, have a great uh, ability to, to influence Chinese behavior. Whether we always exercise that, that ability as effectively as we could is, an, is another matter. Um, but if I was, you know, trying to think about the split between deterrence, and I think I think Derek's right, deterrence slash compellence, uh, on the one hand, and self-interest on the other. I mean, the split I would have is maybe about 70, 30, something Which like that. Which is 70? Deterrence <laughs> slash, slash slash compellence. Now, what about the self-interest part? Well, see, that's that's where it's tricky, right? Because this gets into perceptions of self-interest. Um, Versus, versus you know the reality. Look, the reality is that I would say no country has benefited more from uh, U.S. command of the commons and the globalization that it's brought on and the free flow of, of goods and, and services. No country has benefited more from that than China. And yet, I think except the United States. Um, <laughs> well, no, I mean in terms of in yeah, terms of yeah. in terms of you know. Yeah. Rise in in incomes overall. No, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think I think China because the, because the gains have been from such a you know a lower a lower starting point, and yet I think that is you know it is a dissatisfying position to be in uh, for China today as you know probably with with Germany in the early 20th century to have one's economic destiny you know uh, in the hands in the hands of, of others even though others are invested in the, fundamentally invested in the system. So you don't see, so you haven't given any percentage to the possibility, even if it's small, <clears throat> that uh, Beijing may interest, be interested down the road in a code of conduct and so forth because of uh, 80 percent plus imports of hydrocarbons by sea <clears throat> um, and so forth. No, that's a, that's my 30 percent. Oh, that's yeah, your 30 percent. I thought you said my, compellence. No, 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 oh, no. Sorry, okay. deterrence yeah. slash compellence at Got 70. My, my, self interest at 30. No, I, so I was I never used quant methods in my <laughs> yeah, PhD. I apologize. That's right. That's right. No, so about 30. Yeah, 30 percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my, my, I, I'd agree with that. Yeah, by the way. Yeah. My, my late faculty advisor at UCLA asked me why I wasn't using game theory in my political science PhD. And I looked at him and I said, Rick, you'll see game theory in my PhD when it shows up in your work. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. Um, cyber deterrence is extremely problematic. Um, I see my old RAND colleague, Tom McNower, up there, and it reminds me of when I joined RAND in 95, and I was waiting to get my clearance. I was sitting out on a trailer out in the parking lot, and they handed me a big stack of Kahn, Wolstetter, Schelling, and Ellsberg. We were still reading Ellsberg those days. Um, and uh, you sat out there and read the canon while you were waiting for uh, the system to do its business. Um, I have subsequently gone back through the canon and tried to apply it to, to cyber deterrence. And difficulties that you have attributing the origin of an attack really fundamentally undermine almost all the core pillars of the deterrence canon. Uh, you combine that with our inability for, you know, intended effects. I mean, out in the garage, I've got my wheel of death in my briefcase, you know. Mm -hmm. So many pounds of overpressure at optimum burst tight does the following to a wood building. I still have it with me. Uh, there is no such wheel for cyber, and there never will be because of the law of unintended effects. And so, so cyber deterrence is really difficult. I realize it's a goal. We've put out some pretty milk toast declaratory statements uh, in the last four or five years. Basically, as you'd expect, the United States, when faced with a strategic cyber attack, will, you know, in a manner of in time of its own choosing, respond with the full measure of U.S. national power. 
The problem is cyber is not an area where we have escalation dominance. Uh, because we're so wired, we're actually a big, juicy target. Um, and in fact, um, last year we, we were trolling around in some Chinese cyber chat rooms, and we found a screenshot that a, that a young uh, Chinese hacker had put up of his hack of the graphical user interface for the industrial control system that controls Washington gas here in the national capital region. You know, that's what I mean by asymmetry. <laughs> uh, and so, um, it's, you can't just say you have a credible deterrent because you say you have a credible deterrent. You have to have some Berlin airlifts and some Cuban missile crises along the way. So while that may be a good asymptotic goal for us, there's a good mole lander word, right, Tom? Uh, you know, an asymptotic goal for us, uh, it's not anything we're going to achieve anytime soon. So I ascribe much higher percentage uh, to China's own self-interest, which we're having difficulty getting them to because they still maintain an asymmetric perception of this domain. In other words, that the U.S. and other powers are asymmetrically vulnerable in cyber while they are not. Right. Um, and they are somewhat coming around to it. You know, I mean, the fact that all Chinese credit card transactions are processed on servers in the United States, you know, little things like that. China has set up its great firewall in a way that's fantastic for internal security frankly terrible for waging cyber war. They've created bottlenecks on their own ability to actually be able to have follow-on attacks. Um, so getting back to Derek's point, though, about you know China will start protecting IPR when it has IPR to protect, um, you know, I think the, the point big, I don't agree with. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, but there's an analog in cyber where people say China will begin to care about global cybersecurity when it has its own internal cybersecurity problems. Um, it will it'll start caring about hackers when Chinese hackers from one company start hacking other Chinese companies. Um, but I, I would actually not bet against the Chinese possibility of maintaining those two thoughts in their mind at the same time, which is that they have a domestic problem, uh, but that what goes on in the international space is not a reflection of their domestic problem. Um, and so, you know, I'm actually a, a bigger advocate of, um, uh, of efforts uh, by some uh, to reduce the metaphysical certainty that the Chinese have and the veracity of the information that they're exfiltrating from our networks, such that their own system has to reform and that they realize that uh, that, the, that the game is up at some level uh, and that they have, to, they have to turn down the volume on, on the exfiltrations because they realize that they're simply not getting the same quality information as they were before and that we can find some sort of an equilibrium. But again, as I said before, in espionage, in all cases, uh, there are no rules, there are no norms. I've struggled for years to try and figure out what a Moscow rules in cyberspace might look like um, and it just makes my brain hurt. Mm. Excellent. Um, we'll now take questions from the audience. I have to warn you that if you tell this panel that they're being hypocritical, they won't care. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, in fact, in fact, U.S. diplomats in Asia up until about December 1941 were authorized to say the United States stands by the principle of non-interference in internal affairs, in spite of the intervention of the Boxer Rebellion, the annexation of the Philippines, the intervention in Siberia, yada, yada, yada. So there's, a little, there's a little up. bit of China in all of us. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, uh, please identify yourself. Um, and uh, we have microphones. Um, and we have 15 minutes, so I'm happy to ask a question while people make up their mind. I think you've scared them all. See in the back that? there. <clears throat> Uh, Steve Winters, local researcher. Uh, this to the first speaker. Uh, this is probably a minor point, but with the uh, authors of the uh, new uh, Chinese economic reform seem to be very concerned about this issue of hot money uh, and uh, its deleterious effect, perhaps. Uh, they're trying to uh, find ways to uh, prevent this from happening. How does that fit in with the open capital flows? Uh, what's your take on that? Uh, all right. Um, it's a very important point. It's just a little. It's hard. It's a little hard to tie directly to the, the discussion today. Um, the Chinese have have created. I mean, this may be following on with with Jim's point about breaking their own rules. They created their own hot money problem. All the 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 the, the, the capital flow in and out of China is due to their own rigidity, their own controls. Um, it's, it's nobody's fault but theirs. You know, there was this talk a few years ago that the U.S. was causing inflation in China. Chinese money supply is two thirds larger than American money supply, even though the stock of wealth is one third the size. Right. So this is China's problem entirely, um, and essentially. I, I think they are now using their own domestic weakness, and we've seen this in economics all the time. We do it, Japan does, and did it for a long time. They're using their own self-inflicted domestic economic weakness to say, we can't follow your rules yet. It'll come later, 
So they're, they're using the domestic side to say, I know, I know, we're supposed to do that, but we're not going to. Um, that only works up to a point. The Chinese banking system, which is responsible for all these distortions, was getting stronger until 2008, and then they ruined it with the response to the financial crisis. So they're not getting farther away from being able to comply. So the way I would tie it back to this is, you know, are we at the level of real rules here? No, they're pretty strong norms, and they, they kind of verge on don't mess with other countries during a crisis, which China's done a pretty good job of actually following that rule. But they're not getting closer to compliance, and it's because of their own actions at home. So along the lines of what Jim said, they're saying one thing, we want to follow these rules, we're moving in that direction, but at home they're doing things that are taking them farther away. I don't know if that helps student answer, okay? Thank you. Uh, right I up. can say much more outrageous things if you guys don't start asking questions. We'll take another question. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, <laughs> please. Speak in time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Zhang Hong. I'm from China's social media. I wonder if the panel can put this question into a broader uh, context, because when China breaks the rule, actually there are also a bunch of free riders who also break the rule um, against the US-led world order. So can you put that into context and see how this game would how does this game play when there's a bunch of rule breakers, um, perhaps led by China, um, the US, China, uh, US on the other side? Thank you. Um, well, I'll say, I'll say, for instance, that if I was a global hacker organization or a foreign intelligence service with a SIGINT capability, and I wanted to hack into the United States, I would route all of my attacks through Chinese servers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I mean, in, in when it comes to um, you know maritime claims, the maritime domain, I think I think the big difference, you know, the big contrast is in acceptance of dispute mechanisms. So there are you know there are plenty of dispute mechanisms for for maritime claims. Uh, China stands out as you know one country that's you know that's opposed uh, multilateral dis, uh, dispute resolution and, and sought to do it bilaterally. So it's not it's, it's less the nature of the dispute, but than how it's how it's dealt with. On the econ side, that's an excellent question. Um, one of the functions of China being big is when China breaks a rule, everyone notices and they think, hmm, did they get away? You know, did they get away with breaking that rule? Was it beneficial to them? So for a little while, we had people talking about state capitalism is going to take over the world. Now we have Chinese state firms being the most indebted of any large economy. So hopefully that is checked. But the point is, when China did it, when China had this model, it got a lot more attention and more people following and more people bringing this up in international uh, discussions than than when other countries might have done it who were smaller. So I think you're absolutely right that that one of the reasons we emphasize China breaking rules so much beyond the, the, their behavior being bad is that it's China breaking the rule. We can all see it, and others are going to copy. Yeah, I, and, I, and I will say that uh, all the other countries in the world that are looking at this move of international internet governance away from ICANN, which, by the way, was never a trans paw of the Commerce Department. That was the most ludicrous argument ever. Anyone who ever met Esther Dyson or Rod Beckstrom and asked them how they felt about the US government, they were clearly not a cat's paw of the Commerce Department. Um, but as we move, you know, as China and its allies want to move that to the ITU, there are a lot of countries that are going to free ride on China and Russia's leadership on that in order to be able to change elements of the international order in that area uh, to their liking. And there will no doubt be explicit or implicit payoffs uh, to the countries who buy into that new sovereignty construct for cyber. I would say, though, because you asked about, in effect, a, a, a loose coalition of revisionist states opposed to the United States. And China, for all the reasons everyone's been saying, it's big and it's highly dependent on the international co economy. China's not in the same category as Iran or North Korea or in some ways even India mm -hmm. or Russia. So um, when people talk about um, China learning the wrong lessons from the Crimea, yes, there are some very impressive lessons on how to combine special forces and economic and you know, informational tools, <clears throat> but, uh, but Russia doesn't care. Putin doesn't care as much about U.S. relations or the international economy as Xi Jinping has to, and that's even more the case when you're talking about Iran. So there will be areas, yeah. I think uh, Jim pointed to one of the most <laughs> important, um, telecommunication slash cyber um, or human rights and democracy, um, or general questions of uh, interference in international affairs, will, there will be alignments of convenience. But a coalition of revisionists, I think, is actually con very contrary to China's interests, um, in spite of my <coughs> earlier statements about um, interdependence and so forth. Um, I thought I saw another hand. Yes, right here. <coughs> 
Hi, I'm uh, Bruce McDonald with the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I'm an adjunct at Johns Hopkins SICE. Um, I'm a part of a couple of uh, uh, Track 1.5 dialogue groups, and one of them is on strategic nuclear dynamics. I wanted to respond to uh, a comment of, uh, of Jim's, your good Irish name, and it's very good. Mm -hmm. um, one, on your, your comment on no first use, um, I don't think the existence of mobile ICBMs per se is necessarily uh, means that they are being hypocritical about no first use, but I do think that uh, uh, the fact that it, there was no mention of no first use in their most recent defense white paper is interesting. And also that if they start putting missiles to sea, and yet they say, oh, we always keep our nuclear warheads demated from our missiles, well, how does that work? Now, that, I think, it's uh -huh. in spades, says how, how does that, uh, how, how do they square that? Um, but I wanted to, uh, one thing that in, in the dialogue that uh, drives me nuts, uh, and this is not quite rule breaking per se, but uh, in line with your theme that, of course, the United States never tries to have it both ways. But here, I, where I think China does is China will very often make the point about, well, we're just, we're a, a smaller power. We are, uh, and yes, transparency in theory is nice, but really, the weaker powers, and we are much weaker than the United States, uh, we tend to benefit more from opacity than from transparency. Mm -hmm. And um, at the same time, they want to say that, well, we're a big power in other spheres. So I guess my question to you or anyone in the panel there is, uh, do you see any signs that as as China begins to more feel its oats as a major power and should be taking more responsibility as well as rights, do you see any signs of that tendency to want to have it both ways changing, or are we uh, sort of stuck with that for the duration? After all, they've gotten a lot of mileage out of it. I mean, if I were them, I might want to stick with it uh, as well, but I'd be interested in your perspectives on that. Well, Thank I you. mean, it, I don't think it's an accident that the Track 1.5 on cyber that I'm involved in, your nuclear one, previous nuclear 1.5s I've been involved in, space 1.5s, you have to say to yourself, why do they prefer this track? Why do they want to have a track that's not track one, it's not gov gov, it's not track two, pure academic, but they want to have this one that's sort of a mix of government officials and non-government officials, and government officials can make non-statements and issue non-papers and do all these sorts of things. And the argument is, is because of their asymmetry. They want to be able to communicate and message, but they don't want to be held to any deliverable that comes out of these meetings. So they feel like, given their self-perception of that asymmetry, those are the ideal places for them to be. Now, they've all, in various stages, the cyber one has basically morphed into a 1.1 at this point. Um, and it became the, the, the cyber working group under the strategic economic dialogue which still is having meetings about scheduling meetings, about having more meetings, about scheduling the meetings, about the size of the table and the protocol arrangements about the next meeting and the timing of the meeting. Uh, but it, it nonetheless provided a, a channel. Um, but I think that, that that is a manifestation. Their use of those channels is a manifestation of their unwillingness to get beyond the playing it both ways that you're talking about, Bruce. Now, on the nuclear side, I realize the nuclear force is small. I'm just challenging people to think um, more creatively and more out of the box than they have historically as we see a sort of technologically determinist sort of modernization of this force. And I'm not talking about intentional breakout. I'm talking about the leadership waking up one morning and looking at a very robust road mobile force and possibly an at sea SSBN force and simply asking the question, hey, did we just wake up this morning with a limited war fighting force or a force to frap? And then the snowflakes start coming down into the Chinese policy system. Tell me what I can do with this thing. But they'll never abandon no first use. And that's my point. So we read this Chinese book, this, you know, the second artillery campaign operations book. And it, there's a, two pages where they talk about the seven criteria under which China will fire first. So, you know, and some of them, all, you know, apropos of the global, you know, the conventional precision global strike discussion, some of the reasons, some of the criteria where China will go first in nukes, it says if we are attacked by conventional forces that attack our nuclear forces with, a, with an effect that, is, that, that approximates what a nuclear attack would be. Well, that's, that's hypersonic glide. That's railgun. That's, that's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, uh, that right here and now uh, that would cause them to do that. But how do we negotiate with them? How do we deal with them bilaterally at the strategic level if there is this such a, a huge chasm between their stated 
doctrinal position and their facts on the ground of the forces that they have. Yeah. So there, did you want to say something on this? Yeah, I, would just, I mean, <laughs> I, I, would, I would chime in, and I, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, look, I think the, you know, the concern is that, yeah, I, don't, I don't see the, the political statement of no first use going away, but that exists you know, uneasily uh, with a number of developments in force posture, but also these, these doctrinal statements that, um, you know, that, that seem to point at least to some major qualifications in, in, what, that, in what that means. Um, your, you know, your last point was, uh, um, you know, them having it both ways. I think in part in the nuclear realm and, uh, and related realms, uh, they can have it both ways because we let them have it both ways. So on the one hand, the United States and Russia, uh, not always, you know, not not currently on the best of terms. We have clarified our our nuclear our nuclear posture. Uh, they want to play a, a big role, and yet they're unwilling to clarify their posture, let alone participate in strategic uh, nuclear arms negotiations. The United States and Russia eliminated a whole class. Of, of weapons, uh, and it's a you know it's it's a class of weapon that that China has deployed and continues to develop and deploy in great great numbers. So uh, and yet you know the, I don't hear discussions about globalizing the INF treaty, um, which I think are, would be you know would be warranted. And I don't hear our diplomats engaging the Chinese in in discussions uh, along those lines. So we, 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 I think we, we sometimes abet that type of uh, uh, having it both ways. I think across all three of your <clears throat> areas, the, the, the better play increasingly is going to be multilateralizing, as you pointed out, um, code of conduct in the South China Sea. Um, to the extent we can get norms on cyber and space, a multilateral approach is going to be more effective, and then TTIP, TPP, and broadening the uh, the, the rulemaking and norm making. Yeah. That's going to be the play. I want to ask one really quick question before Oriana can get up here and pull this off of me. <clears throat> um, look, the the nuclear is a perfect example, and you can give many more. There's a no first use policy that's stated usually by the foreign ministry, yeah. and then there's a war fighting doctrine usually that comes out of the Academy of Military yeah. Sciences or the PLA, which contradicts it. So, you hear two takes on that. Mm -hmm. One is you know, stove piping, uh, it's a problem. It's a good thing that Xi Jinping is creating a National Security Council at NSP. It's a good thing that he's centralizing economic reform and uh, counter-corruption. The centralization of authority, this presidential style of decision-making and strategy, it's good, because it'll, it'll empower the foreign ministry and their nationalists, and it'll get rid of these, you know, problematic um, gaps. The other view is, no, no, no. You sent, this is all quite strategic and deliberate. You centralize it under the, an NSC, or you centralize economic reform, and you end up with much more effective use of these state instruments mm -hmm. to break rules and norms. So we only have 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to violate Oriana's norm <laughs> um, uh, for just two minutes. If, if, and I'd be very interested in each of your takes mm -hmm. on, on, on how much of this is an accident of stovepiping that could be fixed by centralization with a strong a little like Xi Jinping, or how much of it could actually get worse? Uh, I mean, in econ, this is straightforward. There's a reform camp that's led by the People's Bank, and then there's a centralization camp that's led by the NDRC. And if you know Xi Jinping comes in and says, I will adjudicate among these, and you will follow my orders, and he can be effective, as Deng Xiaoping was when he initiated reform in a much more difficult situation, then reinitiated it after Tiananmen, um, then, okay, well, they become more effective. And then the following question is, they become more effective doing what? Well, they have this sweeping reform announcement that they say they want, but it's all very vague. It isn't going to work as it is. So if you believe Xi Jinping is really committed to market reform, it's great that he would centralize power and make that decision. And if you think he's not, then we have, exactly as you pointed out, a more, a more concentrated you know, a, a suppression of the reform camp, and we have a China that will cheat more effectively internationally. So that, you know, unfortunately, you, we, we don't have enough information to answer about him yet. Okay. That's the risk. <clears throat> yeah, I, th I think our, our perception is uh, that China's leaders think about defense and, and, and national security externally uh, much more than they actually do. Uh, even in the you know the discussions about the you know National Security Council, I mean it's primarily yeah. domestically focused, and so I you know whether it's centralization or not, I don't see that changing. I think look the big the big military decisions get the attention of the leadership, uh, and other ones don't. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I don't I don't see that being as, as big a driver in, mm -hmm. in, in defense. So we had the Central Military Commission. That's all that mattered anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, in cyber, the lack of centralization is a huge problem, and it's a huge problem because their system is very different than ours. They have this bottom-up entrepreneurial grassroots cyber espionage system. You know, go let a thousand, you know, let a hundred schools contend. In sharp contrast to ours, which is top-down, tight sphinctered, heavily controlled, um, and we need to drive their system up that way because it's this grassroots decentralized system that has contributed to the volume and even the redundancy. You know, same, same, different intrusion sets going after the same targets, you know, all kinds of interesting things. I want to drive them to a centralized process, but for a perverse reason. And that is because I know that the extent to which they centralize that decision making, mm -hmm. um, and next to every three PLA technical reconnaissance bureau operator is someone from the inspector general's office and a lawyer and an <laughs> auditor, that their system will grind to the same halt that ours has. <laughs> and that by definition, because of all that paperwork, that the volume of the intrusions will go down. Um, um, and so by pointing out to them, you know, what's going on on an ad hoc level at the, low, at the lower levels, um, I think it plays naturally into their desire to centralize the system. And I think that that will actually allow us to establish some sort of a Moscow rules uh, in cyber, which we couldn't do as long as there were two dozen sets operating relatively independently and encouraged to just go out and be fruitful. Excellent. Um, uh, Jim, Tom, and Derek, thank you. That was a great panel. Um, thanks for indulging the extra two minutes, and thanks for your participation. Mm -hmm. That's good.